Putin wants regime change in Ukraine and uh, Biden wants regime change in Russia, which raises the question, what about regime change, lawful regime change in America? The left desperately wants New York to file criminal charges against Trump, and I think we all know exactly why. Biden has a new tax proposal, but it has a very old, tediously familiar ring to it. Missy Robertson, the star of the popular family-focused TV show Doc Dynasty, is going to join me. We're going to talk about her new children's book, and I'll continue my discussion of Ugo Lino deep in the depths of Dante's hell. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. <laughs> Needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division, and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. In the kind of uh, one step forward, one step back manner that has now come to characterize, if not define, the Biden administration, Biden says, that he wants regime change in Russia, and then the White House clarifies that he doesn't. (laughs) So this all started when Biden was giving a talk to some of the troops, and he says that Putin, quote, cannot remain in power, end quote. So the implication could not have been more clear that it's going to be part of U.S. policy to get Putin out. Now, let's remember that this is actually consistent with things that, for example, Lindsey Graham said, several weeks ago when Graham, in effect, said, listen, why isn't there somebody who's going to uh, sort of rise up? And and now in in Graham's case, he was talking about somebody in Russia. But Biden's implication was somehow that it would be a strategy of the United States to be working perhaps with other generals, other figures in Russia to oust Putin from power. Now, needless to say, this is a very dangerous and provocative thing to be saying from the... um, uh, leader uh, of America to a nuclear tipped adversary. If, uh, if um, Putin were to think that his own existence and power and his probably his own life were somehow jeopardized by what the U.S. is plotting against him, think about how uh, he might react to that. So the United States, I think, it's completely one thing to say, all right, we're going to try to have regime change in Iraq. We're going to get rid of Saddam Hussein. And of course, uh, under Bush, uh, we did. Or that we're going to have regime change in Libya, uh, as we did under Obama. And we're going to get rid of um, of uh, Gaddafi. Uh, and that did happen. But it's a whole different matter to say this about the Soviet Union, just as it would be a whole different matter to say this about China. So here's an unbelievably um, reckless and irresponsible statement by Biden. And the White House, however, instead of um, um, talking to Biden and having Biden go out himself and clarify and clarify here, let's be clear what we mean by this. Uh, Clarify doesn't mean that Biden said something he didn't mean. He actually did mean it. It's very clear from the original remark that Biden doesn't think that Putin should be the ruler of Russia. But it's almost as if when the White House comes out right after that and goes, no, 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 that's not really not what he meant. And then here's Jake, uh, sorry, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, walking back the remarks, quote, we do not have a strategy for regime change in Russia. So this is like Biden says A, and then Blinken says not A. And this is another way of saying, I think, that Biden's not really in charge. Biden says what he thinks. And then the rest of them tell him, that's not what you think. Meaning they're the ones deciding. And think about who's the they? The ones deciding haven't gotten one vote from the American people. These are appointees. And yet they very clearly are driving Biden and not the, not the other way around. So, um, uh, Putin continues to uh, execute his plan in the Ukraine. And look, the, to me, the kind of interesting uh, conclusion from all this is that here you have Putin. He wants regime change in Ukraine. Uh, and then you have Biden. He wants and then doesn't want, uh, but maybe secretly wants regime change in Russia. 
And the question I want to leave with you with is, what about regime change in America? I think all of us, in fact, a majority of the American people, according to most polls, would like to see Biden out of there. They don't really believe he's doing a good job either on foreign policy or on the uh, economy. Now, we're obviously not talking about, we're talking about lawful electoral uh, regime change brought about through the democratic process. But I think that's the kind of regime change that I and probably you and most certainly most Americans are wishing for. I just got a call a few days ago from Mike Lindell. He's like, hey, Dinesh, you got a big movie coming out. I want to help you get the word out. I want to help you spread the message. And this is Mike Lindell. He's just got a big heart and he likes to get behind issues and he's willing to put himself on the line, which I love. Let's support Mike and let's support his products. And I want to talk today about the MyPillow towels. Now, ordinary towels just don't seem to dry you very well. They feel soft and lotiony when they're new in the store, but you take them home and they don't absorb. Why not? Because towel companies typically import the product and they add softeners to make the towels feel good, but they don't dry you very well. Now, Mike Lindell has solved this problem. He's created the best towel company right here in the USA. They have proprietary technology to create towels that feel soft and actually work. They're all made with USA cotton. They come with the MyPillow 60-day money-back guarantee. And these are the only towels that Debbie and I use in our home. For a limited time, Mike is offering a really good deal on a six-piece towel set. Now, that's two bath towels, two hand towels, two washcloths, all made with USA cotton, normally $109.99, but now $39.99. Call 800-876-0227. That's 800-876-0227. Or go to MyPillow.com. Take advantage of this offer, but get deep discounts on all the other MyPillow products. But make sure to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. The um, left has been desperately hoping that they can somehow get the Manhattan district attorney to criminally indict Donald Trump. Now, the motive for this couldn't be more clear. It's not even quite so much that we want to, that they want to uh, find, um, lock Trump up, although they would love to do that because he to them represents the um, kind of acme of villainy. So they would love to see him behind bars. But their real goal, their um, sort of proximate objective is to prevent Trump from running again. If Trump is under criminal indictment, he'd have to defend himself. There'd be a cloud over Trump. He'd be dealing with this nonstop. And the chances of him being able to mount an effective campaign in 2024 would be would certainly be reduced, if he could at all. And um, But the plans of the left have gotten a kind of setback because um, the Manhattan district attorney, a guy named Alvin Bragg, uh, reviewed the evidence produced by this whole team of prosecutors, a team headed by a guy named uh, Mark Pomerantz and another guy uh, named Kerry Dunn. And he looked at it and he goes, eh, there's not enough here. Um, and I think uh, in particular, they can't get witnesses to testify against Trump. They've been desperately trying to get people within the Trump organization to sort of spill the beans or sort of rat Trump out or somehow point the finger of blame at Trump. But Trump inspires so much uh, professional loyalty within his organization that they have sort of struck out again and again and again. And so nevertheless, the uh, prosecutors, Pomerantz and Dunn, uh, begged um, Bragg to go ahead. Um, and, um, and they said that, quote, um, this is something that has to be not just done, but done now. Uh, and in fact, kind of amusingly, Pomerantz goes, with it, as time passes, the case kind of begins to weaken and the chances of being able to bring it off uh, go down. So it's almost like they're saying they have a window of opportunity. We've got to move. And Bragg's like, no, there's no there there. There's not enough to uh, make an indictment. And of course, there are huge implications to indicting a former president. And so um, disappointed and in fact uh, frustrated and exasperated at Bragg's refusal to go forward, uh, Mark Pomerantz and Kerry Dunn resigned. And in, and in resigning, they basically almost, you can say, shut the case down and not shut it down entirely in that Bragg, the Manhattan DA, says an investigation is ongoing. But Pomerantz recently le uh, released his resignation letter, one of those self-justifying, you know, I'm the martyr. This is a, I worked so hard to bring this about. One of these, um, 
kind of embarrassing to read type of documents. But, um, but the main thrust of it is that, um, I believe your decision, he's talking to Bragg, not to prosecute Trump now and on the existing record is misguided and completely contrary to the public interest. <laughs> the public interest here is supposedly that, that Trump never be, be able to run again. Parmaran says that he believes Trump is, quote, guilty of numerous felony violations. And uh, he goes on to say that Trump has, quote, a long history of fabricating information, lying about his assets to banks, the national media, counterparties, and many others, including the American people. So apparently, I think this refers to a statement Trump once made estimating his own net worth. Uh, I believe Forbes magazine had put Trump's net worth at a billion or two billion. And Trump was like, no, it's a lot more than that. Uh, and I believe that Trump was uh, in part drawing upon the uh, estimated value of the Trump brand, which of course is obviously of some somewhat subjective and is obviously worth a lot. Can you imagine the name recognition, for example, worldwide? Trump is probably the most famous name in the world. Now, Trump himself has issued a sort of petulant and dismissive, very Trumpian statement, a radical left lawyer who works with Chuck Schumer's brother at a Democratic law firm. He points out that the firm represents the DNC as Hillary Clinton's law firm, has politicized our justice system. And he basically goes, why don't you guys get back to solving the skyrocketing crime problem in New York instead of going after me? Well, the answer, of course, is the Democrats don't care about the crime problem. In fact, they're in some cases kind of on the side of the criminals. And... Um, but there is one particular guy that they do want to put into their criminal crosshairs, and that is Trump himself. Uh, I, I think this is happening at a time when the Democrats are very aware that Biden's poll ratings are hemorrhaging. Uh, people are beginning to recognize what a fool is in the Oval Office. And this naturally is going to produce some or a buyer's remorse. Hey, you know what? I wonder if we should have voted for the other guy. Uh, and the anticipation that maybe it's better to have Trump back back in the White House. And so the left is desperate to avoid this. And so what are they trying to do here? What they're trying to do is create a criminal um, um, atmosphere in order to pr prevent the American people having a say in 2024 about who they want to be their next president. They want to take Trump off the eligibility list. And this is a whole elaborate scheme, and evidently a scheme that at least to this date, the Manhattan DA is not willing to go along with to achieve that nefarious objective. Have you noticed lately that criminals, illegal migrants, corrupt politicians, even tyrants are getting all the protection? I say it's time we protect what is right and good, and my friends at AMAC can help you to do just that. Now, AMAC is the Association of Mature American Citizens, and they're standing up for your conservative values and for the future of America. AMAC is the conservative voice for mature Americans, and AMAC stands up for the causes that freedom-loving Americans share. By joining AMAC, you'll combine efforts with over 2.3 million members who share your values, and you'll receive exclusive benefits, discounts on travel, cell phone plans, and so much more. Go to AMAC amac.us slash Dinesh and join or renew today. Debbie and I are proud members and for just $16 a year, you can be one too. It's time to protect faith, family, and freedom. Join AMAC today by going to amac.us slash Dinesh. That's amac.us slash Dinesh and take a stand for America. Biden's uh, last big uh, economic initiative, the Build Back Better a trillion dollar boondoggle, uh, burned out like a falling star. And um, not entirely surprisingly, the Biden administration has cooked up a new tax proposal. Now, uh, this tax proposal is interesting in that it seems to include a component of a wealth tax. Uh, what's a wealth tax? Well, a wealth tax should be distinguished from an income tax. In an income tax, you're taxed on the money that you earn in a given year. And in a wealth tax, you are taxed on what you own. You're taxed on what you have. Now, Biden isn't proposing exactly that people, in this case, rich people. The New York Times says billionaires. Here's the title of the uh, New York Times article, Biden to include minimum tax on billionaires in budget proposal. But the uh, article is contradicted 
uh, by the second paragraph, which I'm now re- going to read, the tax would require that American households worth more than 100 million pay a rate of at least 20% on their income, as well as unrealized gains in the value of their liquid assets, such as stocks and bonds, which can accumulate value for years, but are taxed only when they are sold. Now, first of all, somebody who makes $100 million, somebody who's worth $100 million is not a billionaire. It's time to just lay out what a billionaire is. So you, we all know what a million dollars is. It's one with six zeros. A thousand million makes a billion. A hundred million is one tenth of a billion. So the New York Times apparently doesn't know the difference. So you got this writer, Zolan Cano Youngs. <laughs> Zolan Cano Youngs has no idea that a hundred million is one tenth. So he goes, Biden to include minimum tax on billionaires. It's, it's, it's to fortify the democratic rhetoric. We're going after the billionaires. They can't really say we're going after the millionaires because too many American families, including a lot of democratic families, are millionaires, including, by the way, families like, um, like Bernie Sanders. Now, what is interesting here is that this wealth tax, uh, and I'll talk about in what sense it is a wealth tax, picks up from people like, um, um, uh, Senator Ron Wyden, the Democrat of Oregon, or Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, they've been pushing some form of a wealth tax for years. Now, in Elizabeth Warren's case, she just wants to take uh, these very wealthy Americans and take their net worth and charge them 1% or 2% on the total every year. So this is truly a kind of wealth tax in the classic sense. It's kind of adding up your assets, and let's say your assets are worth... $300 million, you would then pay $3 million or maybe $6 million if you go to 2% per year just for having it, just for having all that dough. Now, Biden's proposal is not that. Uh, it's not just to tax wealth across the board, but rather it zooms in on stocks and bonds. And those of you who have assets in the stock market, investments in the stock market, know that if you buy a stock, let's say an Apple stock or any other type of a stock, and the stock goes up 10 or 20 percent, and you don't sell it, you hang on to the stock, you don't pay taxes on it right away. Even though the paper value of your money has gone up, uh, when you sell it, then you have to calculate your gains and you pay taxes on that income. Why? Because you've actually taken it out as income. And so Biden is zooming into this. He's basically saying that, listen, if your assets go up, your investments, your stocks and bonds go up in value, uh, your net worth has gone up, even if you haven't cashed out, even if you haven't sold that stock. So you need to pay a tax on that accumulated appreciation. But of course, part of what happens here is that stocks go up and stocks go down. So a stock may go up 20% and you haven't taken, you haven't sold it. And the next year it goes down 20%. So you're right back to where you were before. And yet under Biden's proposal, you would pay taxes on the, on the stock going up. Obviously you wouldn't pay taxes, but you wouldn't get any of that money back if the stock goes back down. So you can kind of see the unfairness of it here. So look, I'm not going to be, you know, particularly in an age when a lot of these billionaires are leftists, they're deploying their money to support the uh, the woke culture of the left. I'm not exactly sympathetic to these characters. And so any effort to raid their wealth on the part of the Democrats, it's like, listen, you voted for these guys. If they're going to go after you, you have sort of made uh, your own bed. You lie in it. So I, I'm not speaking out of political sympathy for these scoundrels. They're actually on the wrong side. We don't need to sort of be crying over billionaires spending, you know, their spilt milk. Oh, the guy to pay an additional 7%. Who cares? Uh, but the point I want to make here is that is that it is a, what we find with these taxes, they always start, let's start by going after the, in this case, again, not billionaires, but centi-millionaires. Then let's go down to the millionaires. Then let's go down to people who make over $250,000 a year. So what you find is that with the Democrats, it, there's a kind of, let's call it tax creep. And it's a tax creep that creeps downward by starting by targeting the very rich, then the somewhat rich, then the merely well-off, and pretty soon it's every single person who earns a dollar in the country. So I'm not in in favor of tax creep, and I'm not exactly in favor of the creep in the White House who's proposing it either. 
Some of us wish we could rewind the clock when it comes to our health, exercising, climbing stairs, all the things young people take for granted is something that doesn't have to stop just because you age. Neither does suffering from the normal aging aches and pains because now there is a 100% drug-free solution and it's called Relief Factor. Relief Factor supports your body's fight against inflammation. That's the source of aches and pains. The vast majority of people who try Relief Factor order more for the simple reason it works for them. Now, Debbie loves using Relief Factor when her shoulder started acting up about a year or so ago. It was the only thing that worked for her and she knows if she stops taking it, the pain's gonna come right back. So Debbie's like, I'm not gonna be without this again. You can also benefit. Try it for yourself. You'll see order the three-week quick start for the discounted price of just $19.95. Go to relieffactor.com or call 833-690-7246 to find out more about this offer. That number again, 833-690-7246 or go to relieffactor.com. Feel the difference. Guys, I'm really pleased to welcome to the podcast Missy Robertson. She's uh, the co-star of the hit uh, series Duck Dynasty, and uh, she's also a um, mom of four, wife to Jace Robertson, a brand new grandmom. Uh, but we're here to talk about a children's book that she has written, which is called Because You're My Family. It's published by uh, Brave Books. Missy, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, and yes, let me, thank you for having me. For sure. Uh, let's start by just talking a little bit about, um, I think one of the great appeals of Duck Dynasty was the very powerful sense of family, and not just immediate family, but almost extended family that came through on the show. Will you, t uh, will you talk a little bit about, about why family is important to you and how you were also able to convey those values through the show? Well, I think that just happened basically, you know, in, in my life. My parents actually moved me when I was three months old away from the only family they knew for a job. My dad was a preacher and took a job at a, at a local church that we still uh, are members of. So we moved away from family and did not have very much growing up. And then I met the Robertson family when I was a teenager. And they just, the, the, there were four boys and one was already married. Alan was already married to Lisa. And so just having that uh, larger family already available to you, I had an automatic sister-in-law. And then, of course, having the children, it, it, it really was just a natural progression of family, adding more and more and more. And then, as most people are aware, just a, uh, less than two years ago, we found out that Phil had another daughter. So that I had another sister-in-law out there. And so uh, the family part of it is a natural thing that the Lord created. He created family. He created the hierarchy of family. But what we do is sometimes as sometimes as people, we're flawed and we make mistakes. And that unconditional love of family is usually not there at, at times. Sometimes problems get too hard or too rough for us to be able to handle or for us to be able to forgive. And so the breakdown of the family then starts to happen. So I can honestly say within my family and the Robertson family, forgiveness has to be there. Without forgiveness, there's no way that we could be able to heal those relationships and forgive those flaws. And so family is very important. And it also means that you have to be able to uh, surrender <laughs> yourself and admit that you have that you've made mistakes. So all there's a lot that goes into family because there's a lot that goes into relationships. But family is very very important, and it takes a lot of work. But the blessings are abundant. I mean, it's interesting how there's been such a um, degree of family deterioration or family breakdown, not just in America but in Western culture more generally, and it seems that taking family as an indispensable institution, uh, as you say, is key to making it work. The families are, are flawed. There sometimes are sources of conflict that arise within families, not just between spouses, but sometimes between parents and children. I think what you're saying is that this is something that is kind of given to us as something natural, as, as almost a kind of a gift, and it's something we should cherish. 
Absolutely. The Lord created it. He, he has his own family. He's the father. He has a son. He has a counselor that he left with us when Jesus went back to heaven. And so he has that comfort. You know, we can, uh, moms are a lot of that comfort within a family. This was not something that just happened to, to, uh, to expand the universe. It was actually very um, detailed in terms of the design of the family. And, you know, the whole thing goes back to love. The Lord did this for us because he loved us. He wants to create an environment for us to love each other. The whole mirror image of the father and the son with us, we should be able to do that with each other and within our family. But we can't sometimes because we're human. So that's why it's so important that you may, you know, you may be thinking or your viewers may be thinking, my family is nowhere near anything that what Missy's talking about, you know, the, the love and forgiveness and mercy and kindness and compassion. It's just not there, but you can start. It can take one person. You can start it maybe with you and your spouse. Maybe you don't have a spouse. Maybe you were left with a child. Start it with your child. It, all it takes is just one person at a time with those fundamental values of love, kindness, forgiveness, patience. It's all of the things that we want to receive from people, but sometimes we're not willing to give back to them. But if it starts with us, then the lives around us will change. Now, Missy, you've teamed up with Brave Books, and you can find Brave Books, by the way, at bravebooks.us. And you've written this uh, charming book. It's called, it's a picture book. It's called Because You're My Family. And it kind of mirrors and illustrates some of the themes that you've been talking about. So can you give us a little preview of what the story of the book is about and what is the lesson that children will take from it? It's a one book in a series of books, actually. It's a number nine in a series of books from Brave Books. So if you started from the beginning, you've kind of learned about the characters that you will find in my book. But Little Valor is a tiger. And in a previous book, he was adopted by his lion parents. And so it's, it's a beautiful story about adoption. And a lot of people can relate to that. But then also the, the love that is shown in this book. Little Valor goes and makes mistakes. He disobeys his mother. And then he hides because he's afraid to get in trouble. He's disappointed. He knows that he's disappointed his parents. But what the parents do is sacrifice their own health and well-being to go look for him in a storm. The disobedience is forgotten at the moment because he is far more important than what he did. And so when they come back home, they find him, they, they bring him back home in the warmth of the kitchen and in the fireplace. And my favorite line of the book, I'll read it. Valor says, Daddy, why did you save me when all I've done today is pout and disobey? And the father says, I love you because I don't love you because you obey me. I love you because you're my son and nothing can change that. That's the value in this book that we want to teach our children that, yes, they're going to disappoint us. We expect them that they're going to disobey. We would rather them not. But when they do disobey, sometimes and I can speak from my own experience with um, a high octane children that you get caught up in just the discipline and the punishment and the over and over. It seems like you just say the same things every day, all day long. And we forget to stop and say, I know you've disappointed me. You have disobeyed me. However, I love you and I'm never going to stop loving you. There's nothing you can ever do that will stop my love for you. And I wish I would have done that more to my little, to my younger children, for sure. But if we can start right there in the, in our homes with this book, and it's a beautiful book, by the way, it, the illustrations are amazing and it will keep your children's attention. So to learn that, that value of unconditional love, the children then in this, in this story can learn how to return that love to their parents and even ones outside their home. And there's activities in the back of the book. There are questions, there are games. So you can actually make this like a little project for your family. And see, it seems to me really important that um, 
these kinds of values, which sometimes don't come out of our mainstream culture, are created and promulgated. So, you know, I'm delighted Brave Books is doing this. To be honest, they've approached Debbie and me about doing a book together. So we're thrilled to be partnering with them Wonderful. a little bit, little bit down the road. But uh, this is exciting. <laughs> the book is called, um, it's the children's book. It's called Because You Are My Family. It's by Missy Robertson. Guys, check it out. Missy, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Sinesh. Hey, who likes to eat six servings of fruits and veggies every single day? Who can realistically do that? Balance of Nature provides that. And their products are 100% natural, vine-ripened, whole food, third-party tested. This is real science, real food, real nutrition. Debbie and I take 10 daily servings of fruits and veggies all in six small capsules. Take a look. These are the veggies right here. These are the fruits right here. No trouble swallowing, always fresh, nothing artificial. They smell great. Balance of Nature keeps all the natural chemistry, the seeds, skin, core, color in their produce. They only remove the water and air. And Debbie swears by this, the fiber and spice. Uh, she says it keeps her regular. So invest in your health, invest in your life. Join me and experience the Balance of Nature difference for yourself for years to come. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first Balance of Nature order. Use discount code BALANCE. Call 800-246-8751. That's 800-246-8751. Or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code BALANCE. It is sometimes said of history that we need to remember the lessons of history because if we don't, they will be uh, repeated to our, to our great regret. And I want to talk about the history uh, not of the American Civil War, which I'm very interested in and talk about a lot, but of the Spanish Civil War. Now, the reason I'm doing that, I'll do this for the next couple of segments, is because you'll see that it has a kind of an uncanny bearing on some of the issues that we're dealing with today. We have to remember, of course, that we're dealing with Spain, a different country, um, displaced from us not only in space, but in time. Why? Because the Spanish Civil War was in the early part of the last century. So circumstances are different, but there also are um, some, um, I think, very telling parallels. Now, most of us, most people in America and even educated people don't know a whole lot about the Spanish Civil War. It is part of the mythology of the left. Orwell writes a lot about the Spanish Civil War, for example. And the general storyline is that um, Spain was, um, the Spanish Civil War was the result of a fascist, namely Francisco Franco, uh, usurping power from a democratically elected left. And um, this is uh, the mythology of the Spanish Civil War, and it's been debunked by a number of uh, excellent studies and books. And I just want to dive a little deeper into, the, um, into the, what happened in Spain, because I think it ties in with, um, with some of the, the um, tensions and conflicts we're having in our society now. Uh, it's sometimes said that democratic uh, regimes are not by themselves susceptible to internal destruction and revolution. Now, we know uh, from the civil war in America that you can have uh, a massive conflict, and there was one in this country, over the issue of secession. Historically, civil wars have occurred not over secession, but over succession. In other words, a king, for example, has two sons. They both claim to be heirs to the throne. And then you have a civil war or uh, going back, for example, to ancient Rome, you have a civil war between rival factions that want to, um, that want to um, seize power and uh, take over the country. Now, what happened in Spain was that a revolutionary sensibility began to develop on the political left. And this seems a little bit odd because um, traditionally, uh, it is believed that revolutionary sentiment comes out of some 
tremendous um, military or economic stress. And so, for example, there were revolutionary sentiments in other parts of Europe in the aftermath of World War I. We know about the revolutionary sentiments in Germany and Italy that developed uh, and, and led to uh, World War II. But interestingly, Spain had a pretty long liberal and parliamentary uh, and um, democratic tradition that stretched pretty far back into the uh, 19th century. Uh, moreover, Spain was sort of very peripherally involved in World War I, and the damage suffered uh, economically due to the depression in Spain was pretty contained, pretty limited, much less than in other countries, including the United States. So interestingly, the Spanish brought revolution on themselves. It was due to a rise of revolutionary sentiment that quickly became violent within Spanish uh, society. And now one of the interesting things to say about revolutionary sentiment is it is it is politically contagious. And by that, I mean once it might begin on one side, but if that side begins to sort of escalate and get away with it, the other side at some point will inevitably respond. This is exactly what happens in Spain. There's a very a poignant and I think instructive phrase by the writer uh, Joseph de Maestra. And he says, the counter-revolution is not the opposite of a revolution but is an opposing revolution. What he's saying is that we think there's revolution, and then we think there's kind of something else called counter-revolution. But he goes, no, the counter-revolution is itself a revolution. And his point is that if the revolution intends to remake society from the ground up, the counter-revolution cannot avoid doing so too. And so essentially the maestro's point is that once you have this revolutionary sentiment that has um, baked itself into society, you're going to end up with a new society one way or the other. You don't know if it's going to be a new society of the left or of the right, but the old society, the old Spain, or in perhaps our case, the old United States, is sort of gone forever. Now, what happened in Spain was that the socialists began to attack uh, the parliamentary system and say that it was uh, rigged against them. They began to say this, especially after the 1933 uh, election, in which a uh, left-wing coalition was just defeated straight out uh, by the right-wing party, which was called CIDA. It's the uh, Spanish Confederation of Autonomous Rights. They won the, uh, the CIDA group won the 1933 election. So what does the left do? They basically go, we refuse to accept the result. Hmm. And uh, the president of the Spanish Republic, a guy named um, Zamora, Alcala Zamora, he takes it upon himself to conclude that, you know what, I, I really don't think we can have the right run the country. It's almost like the right is disqualified uh, from democratic um, rule simply by virtue of being the right. So this shows you how the culture in Spain had become infected with the nostrums of the left. They were able to portray the successful elected right-wing party as ineligible to rule. And so what does Zamora do? He realized I can't give control of the government to the losers. So he said, let me pick a third party. Let me pick a, let me create myself a centrist coalition that includes some elements on the right. So what you have here is almost a usurpation in which the um, Zamora decides that he will ordain a centrist government that will bring the sides uh, together. And uh, the right, of course, doesn't, in this case, have a lot of choice. So they grumpily go along with this. And, and the result of it is that um, you now have essentially an illegitimate force uh, that wasn't, uh, did, was, did not win a, uh, a democratic majority ruling the country. Now, what happens is that the left now turns have, from attacking the right, which they were doing, now turns to attacking the center. And when we come back, I'm going to explore how this cycle of violence uh, initiated by the left at a certain point begins to escalate and becomes now picked up on the right. And that's how you get the Spanish Civil War. The Russia invasion of Ukraine has sent the markets into an uproar. The market's going down. Gold is going up. Hey, this is exactly why you have gold 
as part of your investment strategy. Precious metals have historically been a safe haven in times of geopolitical insecurity. Now, Birch Gold is the leader in converting IRAs and 401ks into a tax-sheltered IRA backed by gold and silver. Now is the time to protect yourself by investing in something with real value. Gold and silver from Birch Gold, if you haven't already. With thousands of satisfied customers and A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, Birch Gold can help you protect your savings. Text Dinesh to 989898 to get a free information kit on gold. There's no obligation. Text Dinesh to 989898. Get your free information kit now. And like me, you'll be thankful that you have gold in your retirement account. I'm continuing my um, examination of the um, Spanish Civil War, partly because, or mostly because I'm trying to draw parallels that we can think about for our own time. And when I left off, a centrist government is uh, ruling Spain, but is being attacked uh, by the left as being illegitimate. Now, the left um, contests the 1936 election, which occurs three years uh, later, after the 1933 elections, and uh, the left wins. But this is an election that is marred by all kinds of improprieties. Again, sound familiar. What you have are last minute changes to election laws that gave the left disproportionate influence. They even correct, uh, created a kind of electoral commission to review any disputed districts. And so what you have is um, following the Zamora establishment of a quasi-legitimate government, a sort of centrist government of his own making, you now have a polluted and disputed election and the left comes to power. But at this point, it's almost as if the whole country looks around at itself and realizes we no longer really have a Spanish Republic anymore. It's been rotted. It's been corrupted from within. Uh, out of this chaos comes uh, the um, remarkable figure of Franco. Now, Franco is sometimes called a fascist and that he led a fascist coup. Uh, but no, Franco was actually a monarchist uh, and a deeply devout Catholic and really a military man. In fact, he was a military man who initially was not that interested in politics. There had been several appeals on the part of uh, the, the right-leaning faction to go to Franco and say, listen, Spain is devolving into chaos. You got to do something about it. Uh, and Franco uh, basically said, nah, I'm, I'm going to stay out of it. Now, the reason they picked Franco, he was a highly decorated military soldier and he had, um, uh, he had a remarkable military record and he was known as a man of some charisma. But it wasn't until a member of the, a sitting member of parliament on, of the right-leaning party, a guy named Jose Calvo Sotelo, was murdered by some socialist revolutionaries uh, that the Spanish, basically, the Spanish right, if you will, came alive. And Franco decided enough is enough. So Franco was sort of drawn into the conflict because of what he took to be. Uh, Franco was actually a cautious man and he had been staying out of it because he thought the risks of a civil war are too high. But once he saw that a sitting member of parliament can be murdered and sort of uh, in a kind of public outrage and organs of the state are involved in the murder. Think about this, using state power to politically target not just opponents in general, but a sitting member of parliament, Franco decided, it's more risky for me not to get involved than it is for me to get involved. And so what happens now is that Franco begins in the countryside to mobilize a counter uh, movement. Uh, and it turns out that he was able to lead this counter movement, this counter revolution, if you will, um, to success. It was a bitter and bloody civil war and it lasted several years. Um, and it was followed by the establishment of the Franco dictatorship. You can't deny it. It was a dictatorial regime. And then there were reprisals because with all the blood that has been, had been spilled by the left, Franco's point was now it's my turn. And so you had a sort of regime, uh, um, an era of vengeance, uh, in which there were essentially Spaniards dangling from, uh, from trees and, uh, uh, Spanish leftists who are being rounded up and shot. Uh, and of course, there's been a huge amount of propaganda about the outrages of the Franco regime and oh, this right wing dictator. Uh, but but eliminating the context out of which all this arose, I think ultimately we see the truth 
uh, of what uh, De Maestra was saying when he says that when you have a revolution on one side and it breeds a counter-revolution on the other, is the counter-revolution ends up imitating the revolution. You get two revolutions, one on top of another, and out of it you get a society remarkably different from the one that you started with. Imagine the lifelong impact of a journey to the Holy Land. Surrounded by like-minded travelers, picture yourself stepping foot in iconic locations right out of Scripture. Join Dr. Sebastian Gorka and Dinesh D'Souza on this life-enriching Israel tour, November 30th through December 9th, 2022. For more information, call 855-565-5519 or visit StandWithIsraelTour.com. I'm continuing my discussion of Ugolino and Ruggieri in Canto 33 of um, Dante's Inferno. And uh, you find with Dante that he likes to sometimes focus on sinners in pairs. If we think back to the cantos we've talked about already, remember the pair in Canto V, and that was uh, Paolo and Francesca. And remember Farinata and Cavalcante in Canto X. And, uh, and this, is, this recurs in the, uh, in the Inferno. And here we have two characters, uh, Ugolino and Ruggeri, one a politician, Ugolino, uh, the other an archbishop, Ruggeri. And, um, uh, and so we have a pair here as well, although as with... Um, as with um, uh, Francesca in Canto V, only one sinner speaks. And so here in Canto 33, it's only Ugolino that speaks. And as with Francesca, when we're listening to Ugolino, we have to pay very careful attention to what he says. He's going to be giving, let's call it his side of the story, but his side of the story leaves a lot out and also has to be somewhat not translated, but decoded for what he is saying and what he is um, uh, rationalizing and what he is concealing. Now, um, the fact that Ugolino is a politician and Ruggeri is an archbishop is also important. Dante is implying here that part of what we're getting in uh, northern Italy, we're talking here, by the way, not about Florence, but about the neighboring city of Pisa, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but is the distorted relationship between church and state. So the tension between church and state is not some kind of modern uh, phenomenon. It goes back to ancient times. In fact, when Jesus says, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, you have right there a distinction between the realms of the church and the state. Uh, and Dante's view is that the leaders of the church have moral authority, but it's over the soul. It's over your religious life, and it's over, you might say, the quest for uh, salvation and for the next world. It's not the job of an archbishop, for example, to be engaging in uh, political rule or political machinations, and yet that's exactly what happens here. So even though Dante nowhere directly addresses the issue, the implied uh, distortion between church and state is part of the story of this, of this canto. And the story um, that Dante is developing here is one of mutual political betrayal. Uh, Ugolino and Ruggeri are deadly enemies. They hated each other when they were alive, and they hate each other just as much now. Uh, you see Dante continuing his pattern where the afterlife mirrors your life. Uh, the sinner, in a sense, gets what he or she wants. So what does Ugolino want? Well, he basically wants to bite the head off of Ruggeri. And so what's he doing in hell? He's gnawing on his head. And, um, and it's kind of, at some point, when you see this gruesome scene deep here in Dante's hell, you might think, well, who's worse off? Is Ugolino the biter? kind of in the worst position, or Ruggeri, whose head is being bitten off and gnawed. And, and really, they're in exactly the same position. They're in a position of mutual recrimination and hatred. And, and part of what Dante is getting at is that the sinner suffers too. So your sin is um, something that imposes tears and pain on the sinner, 
but sins, of course, also affect other people. And here we come to, remember, we're in the circle of fraud. And Dante is talking about a particularly bad type of fraud, fraud that, uh, that betrays those to whom we have a certain kind of moral obligation or trust. And it's also fraud that produces, uh, it takes a toll on innocent people. Now, uh, let me give you a little bit about the background, and then uh, tomorrow we'll actually get back into the text, talk about what Ugolino says, Ugolino's side of the story. As I mentioned, we're talking about Pisa, which is a, is a Ghibelline city. And uh, the, um, the city is surrounded by Guelph um, cities, notably Florence, which happens to be a larger, more powerful uh, city than Florence. And so what these Guelph cities are doing is raiding the Ghibelline city of Pisa and capturing castles and territory on the kind of outskirts of Pisa. And so the Pisans become very worried. They're actually not strong enough to be able to defeat the Guelphs uh, by themselves or, or even with allies. And so what the Pisans decide is, listen, we're Ghibellines, but why don't we bring in a Guelph uh, why don't we bring in a Guelph kind of from the other side and make him our kind of city leader? Uh, the Italian term is, is podesta. Why don't we, why don't we appoint a Guelph as our podesta and then we'll have him negotiate on our behalf and he could probably get us a more favorable deal, a more favorable bargain than we could get by ourselves. So this is what happens. A Ghibelline city hires Ugolino, who's a Guelph, to come in and be the leader of their city and negotiate with the Guelph neighbors or not so friendly neighbors, hostile neighbors like Florence. Now what happens is that Ruggieri is the archbishop who orchestrates or is involved in orchestrating this arrangement, bringing in Ugolino the Guelph. But the moment that Ugolino comes in, you begin a cycle of mutual betrayal. Ruggieri begins, comes to the view that this was a horrible mistake. I should not have brought in a Guelph. And so even though at this point Ruggieri is politically out of power, he's still an archbishop, he begins to undercut Ugolino. And Ugolino, realizing this, recognizing that he's being betrayed inside of Pisa by the Ghibellines, decides, well, you know what? Why don't I restore my old alliances with the Guelphs? And so he's saying to the Guelph raiders from other cities, hey, listen, you come and take that territory. I'll look the other way. I'll send my troops to place X while you seize Castle Y. So what's happening here is you've got this horrible, um, degenerating cycle of betrayal and uh, on both sides. And so part of what we're going to find out as we, as we get into Ugolino's story is that he weaves a kind of tearful narrative, uh, appealing ultimately to the uh, suffering and tears of his own children. It's a narrative that by itself is pretty convincing and draws your sympathy. But even though uh, Ugolino's objective is to say, let me tell you what this horrible, evil Ruggieri did to me, and not just to me, but to my family, what Ugolino always leaves out is, and here's what I did to him. I was doing exactly the same thing to him that he was doing to me. And so what you have here is that Dante is exploring uh, what happens when there is a complete breakdown of trust in a community and the trust is replaced by jealousy, by betrayal, by treachery, by recriminations. Dante is going to look at how far can that go and the horrific consequences in this case for Ugolino and for Ruggieri and for Ugolino's children, we will take up next time. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.